Yo, with Julian on the brown note and a review of Emission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, finally. And the franchise that, like the Fast and the Furious franchise, came of age after a few films had already existed that weren't very good with the Fast series. It was very similar because the Fast 4 had all the elements come together for the first time, but it was Fast 5 that was actually this suddenly state-of-the-art thing and um, the Fast 10 came out this year and was pretty bad. With uh, Mission Impossible, it was a Philip Seymour Hoffman third film that assembled the main elements that would then, in Mission Impossible 4, become this state-of-the-art Bond-level franchise. And it's tapered off a lot less than the Fast franchise has done. Um, and this film's come out, and despite some of the best reviews of the year be, been a failure at the box office especially given they spent uh 291 million shooting budget and probably another couple of hundred million on extras and probably had a break-even point of 800 million dollars it ended up being killed by the oppenheimer barbie phenomenon with one of the stupidest release dates in movie history a week before the release of barbie and oppenheimer so it got kind of killed and they've already it, they they've gone down the same route as fast x which is make it into two parts and the public has never warmed to this from harry potter to the hunger games to twilight to every single time they spread the movie over to ex installments virtually every time it's been a fail Sometimes it's succeeded at the box office, but usually it's been a, a critical fail or a commercial fail to do so. Uh, this time around, it wasn't a critical fail, but commercially, it definitely is an element to it. But, but basically, uh, the Barbie phenomenon, the Opp Barbenheimer phenomenon, killed it. The second week of release, it was just like virtually everyone going to the cinema was going to see one of those two films, myself included. Uh, this is fairly redolent of the other films plot-wise, um, given it's involving one of my most hated tropes of all time in modern movies, and the same thing is happening in the Fast franchise films, where a computer is all-powerful and controls everything on Earth. I don't know why Hollywood keeps writing these films where there is some computer device that controls all the world's computers as though we haven't seen this 500 times. A couple of the things that are in the massive credit column for Mission Impossible 7 is that it actually makes this whole premise interesting for once. And the reason it's interesting is that they make the computer itself the villain. So we actually get a computer that isn't being, you know, it's not a device that other people can use to control the world. The computer itself has become sentient. And we open with a, a Russian nuclear submarine that's been using this super high-tech AI. Very timely, by the way, uh, the fact that it's focusing on artificial intelligence at the moment. But we open with a Russian submarine that is tricked by its own AI to destroy itself in the opening scene. Um, the rest of the film follows a similar path to most of the fast and the Furious films, which is to reintroduce a lot of characters that have existed in the previous films uh, to slightly better effect. The Fast films always take a villain from the previous film and make them into a hero in the next film, no matter what they've done. Um, but this time around we get, if you're a fan of, as I am, uh, English... I guess the, the stereotypical term is the English rose. As some, some <clears throat> in this case, probably 40-year-old uh, English women that are some of the most attractive on earth. Hayley Atwell, who was Captain America's uh, girlfriend, Rebecca Ferguson, and uh, who appeared in several of the previous instalments, and, and Vanessa Kirby as well, who was terrific in uh, a small role, but a much better role here. Um, there's watching it i really really enjoyed this like it's done with so much class the things that really pull this movie so most of it set um once once it's all petered out and we know that there's this uh computer device that isn't 
going to be sold to someone, but there's this mysterious key that might be able to turn it off that is the MacGuffin of the film. Um, and the, the fact that the villains are all controlled by the computer. And the computer, they, there's, the best parts of the film was when they're backtracking over what they've done and asking themselves, were they told to follow the path that they have taken to get to this point by the computer? Because they can no longer trust anything that's happening online. And that old school element of trying to get back to not using the unbelievable tech of the Mission Impossible films it is a high point, but they don't completely stick to it. But um, the whole second half of this movie takes place on the Orient Express going through the Alps uh, and leads up to this big train event. The, there are so many pluses to this film and, and, and some big negatives as well. Um, there's the fast films got into a repetitious state a few films back and just filling up the cast with people that used to be in the other films this is sliding into that but it's at the early stage like fast and the furious 7 maybe um so we do get um far more interesting than most of the male characters uh the the three female characters that's still good um, we get a brilliant villain, and I really liked Isai Morales, who I've not seen in any other film, who works as the emissary of the computer that's controlling everything. He's terrific. He's absolutely terrific. It's a great villain, and they've done well with their villains. So um, I can't remember the guy we got last time, but the guy that played Superman... Uh, he was terrific, and we got Philip Seymour Hoffman in the third film. He was terrific. Um, this is another really good villain. And we also get a fourth excellent female character, Pom Clementioff, who is most known as the much derided role from the MCU universe as the Mantis character with the dweely boppers on her head who hangs out with um, David Batusta's character. And has got often got derided, but here she's. It's interesting how I'm seeing a few films now where John Wick is actually influential on them, and it's interesting that the fast this uh, Mission Impossible film has a character and some scenes where I definitely think John Wick has been a big influence on it. Um, the areas where this film falls down is the fact that it is starting to get a little bit repetitious, and if you go back to something like Four with that whole um, ahead-of-the-curve use of, the, I think, the Saudi Arabian... Uh, no, maybe it was a Dubai skyscraper. And that whole incredible sequence. Uh, this time around, we even get a repeat of the sandstorm. So that's like actually repeating the whole sandstorm episode from Mission Impossible 4, which is incredible, to slightly lesser effect. Again, it looked like the opening to John Wick as well, riding through the desert firing their guns was straight from the last John Wick film. But we've already done that. And um, the majority of this film is on a train and it's on the Orient Express. And we've done so many movies where out of control trains are the thing. Like it's one of the more common tropes. Mission Impossible always used to push the boundaries of incredible new action sequences. So I think those are massive negatives for me. The fact that, that you know, half the film is, is set on a train that's out of control, and I've seen that in a lot of other movies. I want something more state-of-the-art from the Mission Impossible franchise at this stage. Um, so there are lots of pluses and minuses throughout this film. I thought I, lo I love Vanessa Kirby, uh, and I, in fact, I love all the women in it. Um, but Vanessa Kirby is a fantastic actress, and she was... The great thing here is that they make her play Rebecca Ferguson wearing her mask. So she gets to play essentially two characters, which is really, really good. Sorry, not Rebecca Ferguson, the um, Hayley Atwell. Uh, so she, it, Mission Impossible, they always pull a mask on and they become someone else. But Vanessa Kirby gets to play Hayley Atwell as her and herself. So it's really interesting on that level. Um, but it's just retreading stuff at the moment. And the other thing is, Fallout had a much more 
evocative final third with the mountains in Pakistan and the helicopter flight, which was just jaw-dropping to watch. Uh, and Henry Cavill was the villain, having this big fight on the, on the mountaintop in Pakistan, visually breathtaking. I've seen so many out-of-control train films that even though this is probably done as well or if not better than any of them, it is a sequence that I have seen on so many films. It was hard to not sort of relay it as just being a repeat. Um, and the other thing is the elephant in the room, which is the fact that it, they split it into two. So whereas in Mission Impossible Fallout, the last film, and all of the others, you get this huge resolution for the villain and whatever the device is that they're hunting down and all of the characters, you don't get any here. It ends with you desperately wanting to know, that's very true, but you don't get any satisfaction of knowing. It ends at a point where technically you could have cut out an hour of the film and just started the next film because it all sort of resets to being back at the start of the train journey. So there hasn't been any sort of, like that whole hour, hour and a half of the film doesn't really shape anything that's unchangeable. It sort of all goes back to, we fixed this bit, and now we're going to go on to the movie too. But they didn't need to do that detour. So it's brilliant to watch. It's the highest class action you'll see, but it doesn't have the emotional weight or the state-of-the-art newness that I felt watching the other films. Uh, and it is sneakily... The re repetition is sneaking up on it a little bit. So I desperately want to see the next film, which is a long way off now, uh, especially after the box office failure of this one. And I really do want to see it. But this is almost the most stopgap film since 4. So I'm going to give Mission Impossible 7 a 8 out of 10.